right, y'all. Welcome to another episode of TFU. Uh, let's go. Woohoo! As you can tell, their intros are a little mild today. <laughs> mm-hmm. We use the word legendary in the house a lot, but a true, true legend in the house here recognizes one of the youngest, most influential executives under 35 when he was younger. Now, most influential Christian under 40 okay. back in the day. Top 10 producers to watch. Top 100 influential African Americans in America. Devon Franklin in the house. Yo, yo. Hey. hey. <laughs> Thank Welcome you for having me. Glad Welcome to be in. here. Let me, I just want to make one quick statement. I've never met a person that I absolutely believe is better than me. And this guy is. <laughs> oh, come this on, guy man. is better than me no, in every no, aspect. This no. guy is everything. He, no. He's, I watch your interviews and I, I, perfect answers, nice person. You know how to move around. This shit is amazing to me. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. That's, man, hey, that's, no, that's for quite real. a compliment. I, I, I'm learning. I'm I, learning. I'm, I have to watch definitely more interviews. I just want to let everyone else out there know that AD thinks he's above you all. <laughs> There's only one person above him, and that's, that's this man right over here. There you go. Franklin. Born in Oakland. Yeah. Grew up there in the 80s and 90s, right? Yep. That's where yep. you grew up. How was yep. it growing up in Oakland? Let's talk about Oakland for a little bit. Oh, you know, man. 80s and 90s. A lot of, lot of stuff going e on. The epicenter e of culture up there in <laughs> yeah. the Bay. Oh, man. Rap I loved music it. coming loved up. It. Oakland was amazing. My, um, my uncle started a church in East Oakland when I was nine years old. That's still there to this day. It's yep. uh, on 70th and MacArthur. Uh, it's, it's called Wings of Love, Maranatha Ministries. And then. My first after school job was in downtown Oakland on 14th and Broadway at an organization called uh, Occur, which is a nonprofit. So, you know, so much of my upbringing was spent there. My mother, we were raised in Richmond, and then my mother moved us to Albany for the school system. Um, but we were always, you know, in Oakland, man, you know, every week, every weekend, um, you know, for work, for church, family. My mom actually lives right across down the street from Lake Lake Merritt right now. So, you know, Oakland plays a big part in my my story and upbringing. But thankfully, you know, it's like we had the exposure to the culture, but you know, it was one of those things that my mother really kept us away from kind of like, you know, going down the wrong path so to speak. That's yeah, awesome. Now the influences when you were young, your father passed away when he was only 36 from yeah. a heart attack, right? And that yes. kind of wow. played a big role in you moving in uh, yes. with your mom and being raised by what you call the uh what was it? The coalition. coalition of women <laughs> that you were raised by, yes. all your aunts, yes, stuff yes, like that. How was yeah. that being raised up in Oakland by a bunch of strong females? And then you said, obviously, your uncle is a pastor. So that obviously played a big role in your life. So for sure. So, you know, yeah, it was a that? blessing, man. It was, um, you know, growing up, um, my father was an alcoholic. So he was in and out of the house most of the time, uh, my entire life up mm. to the point he passed away. And so when he died, he died in a heart attack at 36 Wow. Uh, when I was nine years old and, uh, you know, it was very traumatic. It was a very traumatic experience. And, um, you know, my aunts were kind of already involved. My grandmother was kind of involved in our life, but it was the death of my father that they really said, okay, no, we have to step in and help my mother with these three young boys. Cause I'm the middle child of three boys. My, my older brother's three and a half years older. My younger brother's three and a half years younger. And so, you know, my grandmother and my grandmother's seven sisters really mm -hmm. helped my mother you know, raise us and help us become the men that we are today. So without them, we definitely wouldn't be where we are. Um, but it was really a traumatic time and a tragedy in the family that brought them together to help us, man. And uh, we're grateful. You guys dope. always were close enough to uh, like attend your uncle's church. So that's where you guys yeah. went or what was. Well, no, it was just it was it was the irony is a, a couple years ago, I did a book called It Takes a Woman, which is an audible book where I tell my family story and I also involve the voices of my mother and my uh, five living great aunts. The oldest is Aunt Nuna, she's 98. The youngest is Aunt Sandra, she's 78. So what happened was that, my, say it again, I know, right? I know, I know. Unbelievable, yeah. almost, she's almost there. So what happened was my father died February of 1988 and my Aunt Ida, my great aunt, Aunt Ida started dating my uncle and basically, long story short is because he had been divorced and she had been divorced, he was a part of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, conference. Mm -hmm. And so they basically said, if you marry again, we're going to kick you out. We're going to excommunicate you. Wow. And so he decided to go ahead and marry. So they excommunicated him. So he, you know, had been in the faith and been a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist faith for, at that point, almost 40 years. Mm. 
And so didn't know what they were going to do. And he and my and Ida said, you know what, why don't we, they felt like God was calling them to start a new ministry. So September of 88, about seven months after my father died, that's when they started the Wings of Love Church in Oakland. And that was the church that then, you know, me and my family ended up going to and being basically raised in. Now, does that have a specific denomination? Because what he no. came from or does yeah, it, is no, it it's, like it's, that he just wanted a place because he was kind of scrutinized by them and maybe thought a different way afterwards? Well, or? I mean, basically, we it, the church was an independent church, you know, but I was raised observing Sabbath. So even yeah. as a Christian, Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, I wouldn't work. I wouldn't go to school dances. I wouldn't go to sporting events. And even now, I don't work on, on Sabbath. So the church was a Sabbath-keeping ministry. But it was independent. Yeah. So, you know, we still had a good relationship with Adventist churches in the area, but we were our own thing and not beholden to a conference or anyone like that. Yeah, and it said you did your first sermon when you was like fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Man. <laughs> no, that was and that wasn't even that wasn't even something I even wanted to do. It was just, you know, we, it was a second youth day. Uh, that we that was happening at the church. And a youth day is basically where the youth lead out in the service. So instead of like when you go to a church service and most of the time it's kind of the older folks doing like the announcements and the welcome, where on a youth day, the youth do every part of the service from leading praise and worship to doing the announcements to reading the scripture, so on and so forth. And so the first youth day, my older brother uh, spoke. And so because I was outspoken, they, they said, all right, you know, now's your turn. Mm. And so I uh, ended up preaching. Uh, there was a great motivational speaker named Les Brown. I know he, Les. We've yeah. had Les on, oh, the he's amazing. on the show. Yeah. He's Les amazing. is one of my good friends. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, man. He's a huge inspiration to me. And he did a book called Live Your Dreams and for that came out like right around the time when I was doing my first sermon. And I remember like probably quoting from that more than I even quoted from the Bible. Uh, and I did it and it went well. And people were like, wow, you know, you really have the gift to preach. You should you got you should go into ministry. You should. And I was like, no. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I said, I'm going to movies. I'm going to Hollywood. I said, that's where I'm going. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Because it mixed with raised, being raised in a church or you doing your first yeah. thing. And then, but you, you went to USC. You went and studied film and business. And it said you used to study movies and TV shows when you were a kid. Yeah. Figure out how they were done so you could yes. just kind of mimic and write them and figure out how they flow. Absolutely. And uh, what was like, what did you grow up on watching or what was your biggest influence, I guess, in the way you make films or, or yeah. what was the one you watched that you was like, oh, I want to do this. Oh, this is man. like it sparked you to. Yeah. The, the first movie that I remember like that was like The Color Purple. You know, that movie was just, even to this day, you watch the original Great Color movie. Purple. It's just, you can't, I mean, come on. I mean, the emotion, the heart, the performances, right. unbelievable. So I remember watching that film being like, wow, I want to do that. And then Back to the Future. You know that franchise, especially the first two of mm -hmm. the install of the of that franchise, were two films. I was like, "Wow, how do you do this? It's amazing!" Like, wait, they're going back in time, and the special effects at that time, and the storytelling. I love that. And then Rocky. You know, I was a huge Rocky fan. I mm. think the first Rocky I saw was Rocky three, and then four, and then went back and saw one and two. And that franchise just spoke to me. And so it was a combination of those movies, and then watching TV shows like The Cosby Show different world that really made me f just become so enamored with entertainment. I, I got inspired. I was like, man, how do I do this? Well, how does this work? How does Hollywood work? And from a very young age, I started researching it and just, you know, going to movies and looking at the credits of uh, who's writing, who's producing and just immersing myself in it. So by the time I gave that first sermon, I was clear that I was going to to pursue a career in entertainment. Uh, that part was never mm. in question for me. And you know, my church community, they didn't they didn't see it. They were like, well, you know, Hollywood is from their vantage point, you know, right. an, an evil place. and <laughs> You're never going to be able to hold on to your faith. And I said, well, you know, I don't know that it is or it isn't, but I'm going to go find out. And that's why I went to school in L.A., went to USC, majored in business, minored in film. And that gave me the opportunity to do my first internship freshman year with Benny Medina, who was, you know, still is, you know, one of the top music managers in the business and learning the business, you know, trial by fire, you know, was the way that I was able to establish a foundation and a foothold uh, for the work that I currently do. How was it being like a semi pastor in high school, though? That had to be like, you know, sometimes well, that's well, for, for lack of a better word, kind of like frowned on like you're not cool or something like that. How did yeah. you how did you even? Yeah, well, well, I mean, I didn't I didn't. 
I didn't look at myself in that way. And okay. even now I really don't like, you know, I've been ordained, you know, as a minister, but right. like, I don't take on people call me pastor, but I don't take that on because I don't have a local congregation that I'm responsible to. Right. Like my younger brother is a pastor. He now is the pastor of the church that we grew up in and he is responsible to that local congregation. That is a very different scenario than me who's, you know, goes around the world and preaches. Right. But I have no responsibility for that local congregation. Got it. So I never have taken on the moniker of pastor, even though I do minister, even though people refer to me as that. I understand why they do. But for me personally, until I have a, a church or a congregation I'm responsible to, I will not take that on because I have too much respect for it. And in terms of being younger, I never thought about it that way. I just was in the one in the group that always was outspoken about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we should move. And right. so everybody came to me for advice and whatnot. And and yes, I was not, I was looked at as cool but square. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't drinking, I wasn't smoking, I wouldn't do nothing. You know right. what I'm saying? Except, you know, I was playing basketball, working after school job, you know, president of student body, doing well at school. And that was just my thing. Like, I didn't really, you know, it wasn't a, there was not, there was no pressure there. It was just That's me cool. being who I was and being cool with that. Uh, right. And not allowing anybody else's expectation to uh, disrupt my own expectation. Got That's it. what I was going to ask you if you was like really into the books and studying because I also like when did you uh, apply to USC? 96, um, 97, something like I get that? 95. 95? 95, yeah, 95. Yeah, because yeah. I read something, too, <laughs> when I was looking up USC and trying to figure out some stuff, um, that they cut their tuition by, like, half the students. They were only accepting, like, half the kids that applied for the first time in, like, 97. So it must have been super hard yeah, for yeah, 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 yeah. to get into it that was, and yeah. to get into the film program. And, like, so many people went to USC so who influenced you while you were there at USC or did you meet anybody in the film department or did do people come back? Like, cause I know Will Ferrell went, like everybody yeah. went to USC. For well, here's film, the interesting right? thing about that. I got rejected from the USC film school as mm. a undergraduate major. Mm. Originally I wanted to be an undergraduate major. I applied, they didn't accept me, but I did get accepted uh, into USC through general admission. So I decided to go ahead and take, you know, general admission and then while I was there, I decided, well, look, I, what's my next best passion? It was business. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do a business major and do a film minor. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't a film major from freshman year, I had more time. And that extra time I devoted not only to a work-study job, but also my internship. Got it. And that internship was the, the, I mean, every job, every opportunity I've ever had goes right back to that internship. So it was a blessing. That Overbrook, right? Uh, well, I mean, Overbrook yeah, and Handprint yeah. and all the things. I mean, my relationship with Will, my relationship with Benny. I mean, everything goes back to that internship. And if I was a film major, I would have never had the time to devote to an internship. And I probably wouldn't even be here today. So, so it was an internship for a bigger company that you worked for all these other companies? Or it was multiple internships to just throughout your... It was just that one internship. I interned freshman and sophomore year for Benny. Uh, and he was... Uh, and, and that was at a company called Handprint. And then my junior year, Will Smith and his producing partner, James Lasseter, started Overbrook Entertainment. I was their first intern. I interned for my junior, senior year, and then I graduated. And I was an assistant for James Lasseter for two years. And then uh, I left there, became a development executive for Tracy Edmonds for about a year and a half. And then I became a studio executive for MGM. I've worked on Be Cool and Beauty Shop. And then a year and a half later, they got sold to Sony Pictures Entertainment. And I became an executive there and was, uh, was there for 10 years. So, yeah. you know, that one internship, I just kept parlaying it into these opportunities. And when you had the job at MGM and then there was like, they said it was out of nowhere, basically, that they were bought up by yeah. Sony Columbia. Yeah. How did it was like the transition easy? Did you feel like, shit, I ain't going to have a job? Or like, how did it feel for yeah. when people were buying up a company? Yeah, man, listen, it was, everybody was getting, you know, paid out of their contract. So I, mm. I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I I had no no plan. I, I wouldn't say I was, like, super worried. I just, I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> <You> know <laughs> I will see. And then, and then you know, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's just the way that God works. Like, I was sitting in my office, and one of my bosses uh, says, hey, you know, come down to my office. I'm like, okay. I go down to her office, and she shuts the door, and she says, listen, you know, I just got off with Amy Pascal, who at the time she was the chairman of Sony Pictures Entertainment. And she said, um, don't worry about a job. You and I have jobs when this deal closes. Mm, that's never, cool. ne never met Amy, never had to apply, nothing. It was just me being me. And however, Amy was like, oh, no, no, we need him here. So 
let him know, don't look, we got you. And so that made the transition smooth. So I got paid out of my contract, which was nice. And then uh, a few months later, was able to start as an executive working at, Colum at Columbia Pictures was the main division for Sony Pictures Entertainment. Got it. And the irony is that Sony was the main funder of Will's company at the time. Yeah. So, you know, I went from being an, a former intern and assistant that worked for him to then being in the, the one of the studio executives working on everything from Pursuit of Happiness, Seven Pounds, Hancock, uh, Karate Kid, After Earth. And so it was just amazing that it all worked out that way. Right. What was your, what was the funnest one to work on, I guess, with him? Or like the, oh, Karate Kid was amazing. Karate Kid? Because it was the first movie that was made, American movie made in Beijing in like, at that time in like 20 years mm. so going to beijing you know i was in i was there i made about nine trips over the course of a calendar month and just the culture the people the experience it was it was amazing how is it how is jackie chan perceived over oh, there is oh, he, it like he's just he is, is it like crazier he, than you, anything you've seen here you, you know you don't even know what fame is yeah <laughs> that's, you what don't know. that's what i heard yeah, until like, you see jackie chan yeah. in china mm -hmm. you don't know what fame is and his uh the, they would call him da Gu, which is kind of like basically like um you know like a god you know what right. i mean and uh you know wherever he would go it was just tons and tons of people and he you know he has to travel with caravans and secure i mean it's just not because there's any there's a threat it's just yeah. to, to move through all the people he like the pope no oh, without a doubt just without a doubt through, so that was yeah. that was amazing <laughs> i mean it's kind of like what you see with like taylor swift like he's that level of fame mm. in yeah. in uh in china and will smith was there to film and all that or just yeah Jay he was there he yeah. was there will was a devoted producer you know Jaden was starring in the film oh. uh so will and Jada were there producing the film they were there every day you know, very active, very hands-on. And, um, you know, and I think the movie is as good as it is is because they were so involved. How was the pursuit to happiness? Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing, too. Like, that was the first movie I worked on as an executive. Touching movie, man. Yeah. Uh, and the cool thing about that movie is it, um, it took place, like, down the street from where I worked as a, as a high school student. Mm. So, and we shot, we shot some scenes right there on Broadway. And, you know, my first high school job, was on 14th and Broadway. And so it was just a great experience to have a Bay Area story be the first movie that I was able to work on as an executive for Columbia Pictures. And then once we saw the first cut of the film, I put together a faith-based marketing campaign on how to take the inspirational message in pursuit of happiness to, you know, the faith-based audience. Mm. And, you know, took Will Smith on the road and, you know, really helped him build relationships within the faith-based space and with pastors like T.D. Jakes and, the movie was was massively successful. I mean, ironically, that film domestically, the year it came out, almost made a, the same amount of money as the James Bond film that came out. Oh wow! Casino Royale grossed like 166 million, and Pursuit of Happiness did 160. That's unheard of for a period inspirational drama. But it just shows, you know, to the degree that that movie struck a chord. Yeah. Do you ever feel? Um Wonder my last that question later, to be honest. But it said when you were doing that one, they said that's what kind of like inspired you to do films that touch people and and you know build emotions and stuff yeah. like that. That was like the turning point for you, where it's like that's what I want to do. That's what I want my focus to yes. be. And then did that take you into more like faith based films, I guess, or trying to come um, there? Because no, no, it, it didn't. It didn't. I mean, I, you know, going back to preaching. So you know, I preached my first sermon at fifteen. But I never wanted that to be, you know, my profession, but I still would do it. Mm -hmm. So then when I graduated college, my uncle, who was the pastor, asked me to start coming up once a month to preach. So while I was pursuing my career in entertainment, I still was going up to Oakland once a month to preach. And so I did that for 10 years. So while I'm climbing the ladder in Hollywood, I'm still doing that. So when it came to Pursuit of Happiness, it was the first movie where it was like, oh, these two worlds work together. Because over here, you know, when I'm preaching and I'm preaching is really a lot of it is sermon. I mean, stories, you're storytelling. Jesus was a great storyteller. So um, I'm impacting people's lives with stories. Well, a movie is just a visual story. So it was the first opportunity where I was like, oh, I actually can put these two things together. And I never even from that moment, I never thought about faith based per se. I just said, oh, I just want to find films that speak to me that I can help improve someone's life with and inspire them and so that that pursuit of happiness was the catalyst to look for more content that could be done um in that way and you open your own 
company, Franklin Entertainment, yeah. right? And then one of your first films was Heaven Is For Real, mm -hmm. $12 million budget, gross over $100 million. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, so that was the film, last so. film I did as an executive. So I, oh, okay, I bought okay. that book and yeah. oversaw that book and developed that book. Uh, Joe Roth and T.D. Jakes were the producers. And yeah, I mean, we made it for $14 million and... Uh, they didn't. They didn't. And you made a hundred million. It made a hundred million. Made a hundred million worldwide. Yeah. So everybody had to give you a deal after that. <laughs> everybody right. should have been beating down your they door. Were. 14 they were fourteen to a hundred. Oh yeah, no, it was it was unprecedented. Like, like even to this day, it's still one of the highest grossing faith based movies ever. Who and, are you uh, associated with now, as far as corporations? Did they give you an opportunity, like a five picture deal, three picture deal? Yeah, I, I currently have uh, a multiple picture deal with Tyler Perry and Netflix for faith based movies. That's dope. And then I also have a multi year deal with CBS Studios for a TV. Uh, production and development. So does that mean like any project that you have, you get to come to them and they got the first right of refusal? Yes. Or how, that's how it Basically, works. Basically, well, well, yes. It's so like, if, if, so like on the CBS front, like if I bring them a project that they want to do, great. We do it, we go figure it out. On the film side, you know, it's like Tyler and I will talk about, okay, Tyler, hey, here's a movie I want to do. If we both agree on it, great, we go do it. If for some reason we don't see it, I'm like, cool, I'll go take it somewhere else. So it really is a first look. Um, that gives me the flexibility to find the right home for the right projects. That's dope. Yeah, as thank you. far that, as, because you were a studio executive in the you know early 2000s, and now you're more in the production side yeah. as a producer. I saw that you recently produced Flaming. Flaming Hot, yeah. 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 So what's the difference between the responsibilities of a studio exec and just a producer, and which one you enjoy more? Yeah, so fundamentally, um, studios are considered buyers, and producers are considered sellers. So when I'm a studio executive, I'm buying content from different producers, agents, managers. When I'm a producer, I'm selling content to the studio. So that's the fundamental difference. Now, the position that I'm in now, you know, given my track record, my seniority, you know, I'm in a position where I can kind of make the movies that I want to make because I'm in partnership with studios that see the value of the audience that I speak to and the stories that I tell. So that actually helps a lot. And, uh, and I realize as a producer, I'm very fortunate to be in that position because that's not necessarily the norm uh, for producers. You know, producing is a very, it's, people don't realize how hard it is, how difficult it is. Getting a movie made is one of the hardest things to do in life. It's every movie is a miracle. No matter how good you think that movie is or how bad, every movie is a miracle. So to be able to consistently get content and movies made is, is a blessing. And that's the fundamental difference is that I'm putting these like flaming hot. I found, I met Richard Montañez and his uh, wife, Judy. I heard their story. I found a writer that I had been working with and said, okay, let's put the pitch together. We put the pitch together. We went out all around town to different studios to pitch it. We had a number of offers. I decided to go with Fox Searchlight. We developed the script. Then I hired Eva Longoria to direct it. And then we put together the production plan, the How budget. How many years and, is that? Oh, man, it took seven years. That's crazy because we just had Keith Lucas on the show mm -hmm. who did, what was the movie again? Black, Black Messiah. And Black Messiah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had him on the show, and he said the same thing. It took him <laughs> seven, eight years. Yeah, so crazy. Then, how do you... It just seems like it's hard as a producer, especially if you're dealing with one project. Are you getting paid constantly as things go on? <laughs> with, or, are you just, or are you just banking on this thing to well, actually come through one day? Well, every deal is different. Okay. So, but when you're in an overall deal or a first-look deal with the studio... As a producer, depending on how you negotiate it, there sometimes they will give you, you know, a certain amount of money a year that then counts against your producing fee while oh. you're getting the films up and going. Sometimes. Okay. I mean, and that used to be more commonplace, whereas now most of the time when you're doing a deal, they'll pay for your staff and your overhead, but they know they don't necessarily give you money. Mm, got it. So as a producer, you know. You got to have, in my experience, like if all I did was produce, that would be tough. But because I'm, you know, an author and a preacher and an actor and a speaker and have all these other revenue streams, it helps me, you know, manage those in between the movie moments, so to speak. So um, because the way that these deals work, you know, that the, the, the amount of money that's provided before a movie gets going is still not really enough to so, be able to make ends meet for me personally. Do they ever happen fast? Well, this is the movie I'm getting ready to produce. So the film that Tyler and I are producing the, uh, together, the first right. film for our Netflix deal, is a film called R&B. 
It's uh, the modern retelling of the love story of Ruth and Boaz from the Bible. Okay. And so I came up with that concept in March of this year of 24. I uh, pitched it to a writing, t- a writing team that I had worked with, had been working with. They loved it. We um, ended up, you know, getting the deal done in April. We announced the deal in April, had a script in June, start prepping the movie in August. We'll shoot in October. That's, That's the dope. fastest. And, and, and I attribute so much of that to working with Tyler. Absolutely. You know, his, his, his system, his mindset, um, his, his determination. And it's just, it's already, you know, we haven't even produced the film yet. And it's already changed me for the better as a producer and just as a, as a thinker. Because his thing is like, we're doing it. It's like, it's not, it's not about permission. It's like authority. Right. Do it. Right. So in taking that authority, this is the fastest that it's ever happened. I mean, almost six months from, from concept to pre, you know, pre-production. I've never seen it move that fast ever in my life. Yeah, I've been to his his campus. Oh wow! Yeah, because I know Steve Steve Harvey really well. Oh, and yeah. he shoots his show on there, so I went there to just go talk to him. His campus is absolutely <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. It's amazing to see. Wow! Now, shooting all the faith based films that you do, um, do you ever see or anything weird ever happen? Because on Passion of the Christ, the dude playing Jesus got struck by lightning twice. I didn't know that. Twice. Oh, whoa, Jim Caviezel. Yeah. <laughs> whoa. Yeah. So, you, so you ain't never, you ain't never that? Yeah. Twice. Whoa. Now, I don't know if that's because Mel Gibson was directing it or whatever the problem was, but you ever see anything crazy, never. spiritual or nothing? Nothing, nothing? like that? No. Oh, no. I got a real Mel weird Gibson question. Mel Gibson must have been calling some, <laughs> I got some a strange weird. things. Do you believe in aliens? Do I believe in aliens? Yeah, I, come I, on. Come I on. guess. I mean, you know, I, I don't know why I wouldn't. I haven't seen enough information. The only reason why I say that, and this might be absolutely ridiculous, I honestly feel like if once an alien lands on the planet Earth, does that disrupt the Bible in any way? I mean, there's, you know, even at the, the end of the Bible, it says, you know, there, there wasn't a room, enough room to put all of the stories in the Bible. So, you know, I have to believe that there's room for things that we may not understand. So no, the existence of aliens don't just doesn't disrupt my faith. What if the alien comes out like, and I'm here to tell you about Jesus, and it's like the same story. You know what I mean? Maybe they got the same story. They come down. It's like, yeah, we just talking. You never know. You never know. That's a perfect answer. Here's my other question, though. In that sense, is like, do you think that? I don't think it disrupts it because it just you can just expand it now and be like, well, nah, it, messes, it like, messes it up for me. You don't you think God just created one like tiny marble? No messes way. Messes it up he for me. He had to be bored after those seven days or whatever and be like, oh, I'm going to do another one. <laughs> and then just threw it out further in the galaxy. I see it like he checks in on his plants. You know what I mean? He's like watering his plants. He's like, oh, I got a cactus over here. I got some succulents over here. He's like growing these worlds. You know what I mean? He can't be up there just bored with our world. That shit is like boring. Mm, I don't you know, know what I mean? That's why I got, oh, I got to get back to them. They got questions. You know what I mean? It's I'm hard struggling. to get answers. His ways are not our ways. Of, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He's got a lot of plants. You know what right. I mean? You know, trying to understand God. That's an eternal process. So, you know, all things are possible to those who believe. So I, I, that leaves a lot of room for a lot of things that I may not understand. Now, what about, you know, the Bible very well, right? I, I hope so. There, yes. What about dinosaurs <laughs> in the Bible? Because that, that's a lot of people's argument that there's no dinosaurs in the Bible. How do you, like, you know, again, how do you fit uh, in dinosaurs well, to the Bible? I mean, Just because you can't fit all the stories you said, but. But I think when you look at history, you know, it's a very easy thing. I mean, we, we found the bones, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, it, it actually said, okay, again, there may are, they are, there are things to this world that we may not fully understand how it all works, but it does. And I think that's God. I think so often our limited human capacity is trying to understand an entity that is far beyond our comprehension. So in these limited moments, like, well, how could dinosaurs exist? And how does that all fit? I'm not going to sit here to profess. I fully understand it, Mm. but I believe it. Let me ask you a question that I believe. I think everyone's praying to the wrong person. Okay. Oh, God. Here we go. Only because the J only started existing in like 1548 in the human language. Mm -hmm. So if you're praying to the wrong name, then who knows who you're actually praying to? So when people say Jesus, his name was not actually Jesus, and you're not supposed to translate names. 
Like the number one rule of Yeshua. trans. Tra- oh, you, that's how you, that's yeah. how you pronounce it? Yeah, Yahweh you, is more in reference to God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Yeshua, which translates to none other than Joshua, I'm just saying. But mm-hmm. His name is Josh. If we're yelling oh. out Jesus, <laughs> if we're yelling out Jesus all the time, that's like a Roman translation of his name that means something else. It's not his actual name. Sure, but I mean, there's a scripture, you know, in referencing the story of David where it talks about man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. So at the end of the day, let's just go with your line of thinking. Okay, it's a mispronunciation. The intent is the same. Mm. I was just thinking there was some guy maybe up named uh, named Jesus that was getting a bunch of inbox messages that he can't answer. You know what I mean? He's like, why am I getting flooded with and then... Yashua was over uh, there, no, like no one's, no one's asking me the right think, questions anymore. I don't think it anymore. quite works that way, but I, I, <laughs> I understand the the analogy, but I don't think it works that way. So you don't you don't find comedy in faith, sure, as a mixture place because sure, yeah. I like my faith with a little comedy. Mm-hmm. You know you what I mean? I like it. Faith. <laughs> you don't have a faith. You don't go to church. You don't do anything. First of all, I created a church and I oh, saved God. six people's life, gave themselves to Jesus oh, Christ God. under my church. Oh, it was God. called Faith Fitness. It was group fitness. I had a pastor preaching and we did fitness at the same time and someone leading it. And six people gave their life to Jesus Christ through my church. Wow. Thank you very what much. Was the last oh, time, wow. the last time you've been to that church? The gym closed down. <laughs> <laughs> the, day, the gym closed down. I can start it back up any day. <laughs> Faith. There fitness. goes that story. Faith. Have you kept fitness. up with those six people? The six, well, no. <laughs> I don't think that's, I don't think my job is to keep up with the six yeah. people. Uh, I'm not, I didn't claim to be you a pastor. Were their leader. I just started a faith. That's uh, cool. About okay. your body being your temple. And Amen. it doesn't matter. It was like a, it was like an overall church. It didn't matter what mm. you belonged to. You just came and you worked yeah. out together. Yeah. He talked about God yeah. exclusively. <laughs> hey, six people. There. Hey, if it was only one, it was a blessing. My sixth great grandfather was one of the first Baptist preachers in America, he used to go up and down the colonies, establishing churches. Wow. I got faith. I got the faith in my blood, my friend. It's running through me. <laughs> it's running around <laughs> Running you. through me. It's running around I love you. it. I'm I just love not it. like churchy. I, I, I always have like, even growing up, even now, like I feel a connection to like a higher being, but I don't feel a connection to a specific church or denomination or anything like that because I think everybody's arguing over the same they all believe in the same thing but they're picking and choosing whose names to use or what reference to reference the overall stories and the things you're supposed to learn from all of these books is basically the same stories or basically the same uh, How would, what people are I don't preaching. Think, I don't think you have enough information to actually answer okay. that. I think is, Devon are they does. not? Overall teaching, like, be good to your neighbor. They're teaching good things. Like, faith, like, a faith is something that I believe in has been, like, you could create, like I said, you could create a new faith. There's 30 new faiths probably created this century we don't know about, but in 200 years, you never know. I seen this thing one time that was, like, the highest populated faiths, and, like, some of the shit that was, like, the highest things that people believed in 400, 500 years ago, we don't even, it doesn't even exist anymore. Never even heard of it. Mm. So people can create these things and create these stories, but overall, it's all the same story and the all all the same belief and all the same things you're supposed to learn from the Bible, in my opinion. That's why I don't feel specifically connected to one church or the other, because I think they're all have benefit. And I think that people who have faith and people who have connection to any one of those things. It's a good thing because they have something to hold on to and thrive to. And I think we're in a place where there's a lot less faith and a lot less people even amped to say that they have faith or, or be a part of something. And I see a lot of bad things happening because of that. But that's just how I feel. Well, talking about faith, I kind of notice that people who believe in God are religious, spiritual, tend to be happier than those who are more, you know, nihilistic. Mm. Have you come across that? Do you have like a sort of explanation why, you know, religious people, spiritual people seem to be happier than atheists? Well, I think that, you know, in my experience, I think there is some truth to that. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, the way we're kind of wired. You know, we try to, as human beings, try to reconcile the unreconcilable, right? Which is like, okay, how does this experience called humanity and life work? And in the absence of, of what we know and what we don't know, there's a gap. 
Mm. And when we fill that gap with God and in the context that, you know, there's a much larger plan and purpose for our life and that there is a creator and that there is a plan, that plan gives me peace in the unreconcilable, meaning the knowledge that I just don't, I don't quite know how, well, okay, why are we here? Why are we, why did we as spirits need this flesh experience? I don't know, but I trust that God has a plan for it. So when I have that level of trust, then I, I, I can be easy about it. I can be easy about life. Oh, wow. There's a plan. This all works yeah. in some way that I may not get, but I get that there's a plan. I get, there's a creator that loves me. I get that he has a son, you know, that died on the cross for my sins. I understand all of these things by faith. And as a result, that gives me more peace and purpose to my life Absolutely. when applied in a way that is consistent with the intent of, I believe, why uh, it was presented to us in the first place. So I do believe there is some truth to that. And I know just me personally, under, believing that there is a plan and believing that this is not all a random experience for me personally helps me on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis to have a more positive disposition, to be kind, to be thoughtful. I mean, I don't know what I would be or who I would be if I didn't have a belief system. Mm. If I wasn't a Christian, if I didn't believe in God, I, I don't know. I mean, that to me would be a very, um, uh, for me personally, a depressing existence. Whereas believing in God and having that relationship and, and believing in the overall plan gives me a sense of purpose, even in the, even in the moments when I may not understand why certain things are happening. The one thing I noticed, like when I was a younger kid, I kind of my parents kind of grew me to. Well, I was put into the Islamic culture, mm -hmm. like when I was really, really young, and then my parents just kind of stopped practicing for whatever reason. And my grandmother used to take me to church every single weekend. She would grab me, "Hey, we're going to church." And but mm -hmm. but I noticed about her, she kept visiting different types of churches. It was almost like she was on this quest to find the perfect religion. So my question to you is, how do you know when you find that religion for you? Mm -hmm. Or or is there only one? Or, you know, I mean, like, what's the real answer there? Yeah, I mean, I do believe, you know, Scripture talks about, you know, the way to God is through Jesus. And I do believe that. And I do mm -hmm. believe that there are many ways people can come to know Jesus. And I also know that some people don't believe that. And God is big enough <laughs> to handle our belief and our unbelief. Mm. And I think that's the part that sometimes... Um, you know, as Christians, it's like we get we start to get in these fights, which is like, listen, this is how we believe. And it's OK for us to believe this. There are going to be a lot of others that don't believe that. And we should hold space for that and hold space for them, not chastising, but through love. The only way to ever convict someone of your point of view, not even religiously, just in life. The only way is when they feel accepted. You've never won an argument with somebody who did not see things your way through coercion, through conflict, through arguments, it never happens. When someone feels accepted by you, then they want to listen to you. And so I do believe that Jesus is the way to God. I believe that in the scriptures. And I also understand that there are people that are going to come to Jesus in ways that we may never even imagine or even know about. And that's okay too. So I, I don't, you know, even get in a fight or a discourse. I hold space for people mm. who have different points of view, different walks of life. And in this lifetime, they may never get to a belief system that I have. And that's that's OK. That's between them and God. My job is to love. My job is to accept. My job is to to create room and space that, hey, there are going to be people that God allows me to interact with that are atheists, that are agnostic, that are Muslim, that are Jewish, that are all different types. But we're all God's children. Do you believe that everybody can be forgiven, though? Like even like these people who commit these heinous crimes and kill a bunch of people, are we really honestly supposed to forgive them? That's where I, I struggle sometimes. Like if someone killed my parents or, or did anything like that, I, I, found, I find that it would be hard for me to honestly forgive them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously forgiveness is, um, can be a challenging subject. However, for those of us who have been let's say on the other end of an attack or, or something has happened to us, mm -hmm. uh, our, our desire d decision to forgive or not becomes our burden. Meaning the person that created the offense, they have to deal with whatever feelings they may have about that. Right. But the longer I harbor resentment, anger, frustration towards that person, I now have allowed them to disrupt my life as well as whatever life they may have disrupted as it relates to the event that I need to forgive them for. So I understand forgiveness can be hard, but it's not for them. It's really for, for us. 
finding in a place in my life where I don't agree with what you did. Matter of fact, what you did was really wrong. Matter of fact, what you did hurt me really badly. But I'm no longer going to allow myself to live under the emotional distress that that event has caused. So as a result, I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to forget it. I will always remember who you are and what you did, but I'm going to forgive you. I am going to move forward in peace because that's how I want to live the rest of my life. I don't want to harbor mm. these feelings. I don't want to keep replaying this event over and over and over and again and, and just hope that something bad happens to that person. Let God take care of that. My responsibility is that I will offer forgiveness when I'm ready to say, hey, you know what? Maybe you didn't intend to do it. Maybe you did intend to do it. That's between you and God. But what I'm not going to do is keep moving forward in my life, allowing what you may have done to me 10 years ago affect me today. That's where the benefit of forgiveness plays in, comes into play. It's for us. It's not for the person that did the committed the offense, in my point of view. Uh, being a Christian in Hollywood, how is the navigation to, uh, through it? Because, you know, Hollywood is kind of known for, you know, having a certain type of thought. And they, you know, they're not very, doesn't seem like very friendly towards religious people. Have you had any challenges or people respect mm -hmm. your beliefs? Yeah, you know, look, I mean, I can only speak from my experience. I, I will tell you, you know, Hollywood has been more welcoming than the church. Mm. <laughs> you know, like Hollywood, in my experience, Hollywood is very come as you are. If you are talented and you can become successful, it doesn't really matter. You, you know, you can be whatever persuasion you want to be. You can wear two left shoes. You could have purple hair. You can, if you come to this town and you're talented and you're creative and you can be successful, Hollywood says there's a place for you. And so me being, you know, Christian, as long as I'm good at what I do, there's always been room for me. Always. I'm every job I've ever had from being an intern to being an executive, they've always known about my faith. You know, I, before I took a job, I would tell them I don't work on the Sabbath. So if you need me to take this internship and it requires me to work on the Sabbath, I won't take it. If you need to take, if you need me to work on the Sabbath for this executive job, I won't take it. Like even when I was working um, for Columbia Pictures on, on Karate Kid, you know, there was one time on a Friday night, we, we were in an old neighborhood and Jackie Chan and Jaden were shooting and Will and Jada were there and there were thousands of extras and the sun was going down. Mm. And I'm like, man, I really want to be here for this shop. And I'm like, yo. Y'all, I got to go. I said, I got to, because I can't, I don't want to break the Sabbath working. So they said, okay. So I left the set, you know, and then the next day I um, ended up going to like the, this park in the Olympic Village just to kind of read the word and relax. And so as I was leaving, I ran into our line producer and he's like, Devon, can you be out on the Sabbath? Is this okay? I said, yeah, no, it's fine. He said, okay, man, because if you lose faith, then there's no hope for any of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's the opposite effect, right? Where, where having faith, ha standing on something, believing in something, mm. it actually, you know, gives people hope in ways that you may, you may never know. I may never know. So it, Hollywood has been very welcoming to my faith. I mean, again, going back to the church, there are some churches that have invited me but then disinvited me you know there's some churches that won't invite me to speak because i'm too deep in hollywood from their mm. vantage point uh but that has not been my experience in hollywood being who i am believing what i believe uh, is is the reason why i'm as successful as i am my business is based on my beliefs <laughs> you know the the opportunities i have with netflix and cbs and amazon is because of what i believe and me understanding enough about the business and understanding enough about my beliefs to be able to merge the two in a way that works for both systems and that is a very unique thing, but it's who I've been. It's not, this wasn't a business plan. This was just me being who I am and these two worlds coming together in an organic way. That's dope. So, so you got on the Oprah Super Soul 100 list. Yeah. What's it like getting on that Oprah list? How's life after <laughs> it's cool. Oprah? Oprah it's cool. Gives she's, you the, she's in it. The node. Yeah, she's, in a, she's an amazing uh, human being, you know, and to have known her now for over 10 years and just all the conversations we've had. I mean, you know, she's she's unbelievable. One of the I mean, one, one of the, the biggest nice films or that inspired you was the color purple. Yeah. and now you know that's right. You're, Absolutely, you're out here full just, circle. Yeah. Unbelievable. It just it's, seems like everything in your life is full circle. It's like yeah. you just got this circle that keeps going around and around, and hitting the tracks you're supposed to hit. But I think know? we all do <laughs> if we submit to it and we surrender to it. I think sometimes we 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 don't either listen to the voice we hear, or the voice says something that we don't want to hear, so we, we say, no, I want to go this way. It's like, okay, go that way, and you're going to see. You're going to run right back into this voice telling you you need, you need to go that way. 
So for me, I've had to learn over the process of all this. Like I knew when I was young, I felt the spirit say, go to Hollywood, but I didn't know the how. I didn't, I didn't, I knew I felt like, okay, I, I'm supposed to go start my own production company. I understood that. I felt that, but I had no idea how it was going to happen. If I was dependent and demanded that it happen the way I wanted, it would have never happened. But me being able to surrender to the how, which is really where God steps in from my vantage point, that's when amazing things can happen because I'm like, yo, I can put my GPS. This is the address, right? Coming here. I put the address in the way that it took me to get here. It may have been different the way it took you, the way it took right. you. But at the end of the day, how it directs me here is really none of my business. All I needed to do was put in where I wanted to go. And so I believe that, you know, saying at the end of the day, not even about being in Hollywood or being in ministry, the GPS for my life is God's will. I want God's will for my life. Put that into the GPS for my life and then surrender to how that manifests. Surrender to what streets that he has me drive down that I may not want to go down. But if I'm driving down the street, it must be here for my growth, my elevation, my information. And accepting life on those terms allows for things to happen that are far beyond my capacity to understand. And I can then live in the like, wow, like, whoa, this is amazing. This is amazing. Doesn't come without moments of difficulty. Doesn't come without heartache and heartbreak and challenges. But that's part of the journey. And I don't know that I would be where I am personally without those, those, those moments of difficulty. But it ultimately comes with the process and the belief that it's all underneath uh, God's will, if that makes sense. So Absolutely. as you were studying in the film industry, there's so many positions. How did you know I want to be a producer instead of cinematographer, director? Because I'm, you know, listen, I like to be in control. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, producing and directing are probably the, the two positions that have the most control uh, in the film business. So I'm like, all right, I, I don't feel at the time, I didn't feel like I was ready to direct. I mean, I might direct in the next couple of years, but in terms of what I immediately gravitated towards, it was producing. I was like, oh, because going back to school, you know, middle school, I was president of the student body. In high school, I was president of my class. I was, I was always in some sort of leadership uh, position. And that's what a producer, a really good producer is, is a leader. You know, you're a leader of that film. You're a leader of that story. You're, you're a leader of your crew. You're a leader, you know, with the studio. So that was the role that I automatically gravitated towards because I felt like that would be the best, um, fit for my skill set and also my level of interest. That's dope. And you've been on uh, Dr. Oz a bunch too, right? And before, <laughs> yeah. like, I feel like before everyone got all their info from social media, there was a real big phase of just like, you hear what Dr. Oz said? Or you see all <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Oz? And so, that was yes. like the place to just get all your info. So yep. how was it being on there or being in front of that audience or I guess getting those type of yeah. people in front of you all the time? It was great. I mean, Dr. Oz, you know, had a really phenomenal time being on his show. So grateful that he gave me a chance to you know, be a, uh, a guest, a recurring guest for years in all kinds of different segments on, you know, personal development and, uh, you know, emotional well-being and, you know, to be able to get those experiences. The thing that I learned is um, it's like how to convey information in a very short period of time. So that really helped develop my chops. Like when you're doing segments of television, Uh, you know, for a daytime talk show, you know, let's say a segment is, you know, five minutes. And of that segment, you know, you got 60 seconds or 45 seconds to get across your point in a way that works for the segment. So I got really good at distilling down what it is I wanted to say and saying it in a way that was effective and clear. And so as a result, that gave me more opportunity. They gave me a lot more opportunities to keep coming because they were like, great, we love when you come. You have good energy. You have good insight. And then also, you you know, you're not making us run over because uh, especially in TV, time is money. And if you start cutting into those commercial breaks as a as a recurring guest, they're not going to want you very, uh, very long and for for, you know, consistently. Yeah, I can tell because this interview is going like an hour on time like we planned. Usually, <laughs> usually we drug out two, two and a half hours in here. Nah, we just stay on the script. You know what I'm saying? I was like, wait, wait. Oh, shit. He said that. Oh, efficient. Up. You know what I'm saying? We efficient up in here. Well, you're a best-selling New York Times writer? Yes. How did you find time to write a book? While you're managing all that other stuff, and what's your process yeah. of becoming a writer? Well, writing is uh, is uh, definitely a passion of mine. Uh, thankfully, you know, I've been able to write, um, I think it's like six books 
uh, and that's a blessing. And and part of it is, you know, having a good co-author who can help me, you know, shape the book. And, you know, we like my the co-authors I've worked with, they will we'll sit down and talk about what I want the, the chapters to be. They'll write the first pass of a chapter and then I'll do the rewrites. So, you know, just finding the time. I don't even know. I just like it was something that I just did along the way and I've always done along the way. And, I, and I'm passionate about it. Like, I'm passionate about these thoughts. I'm passionate about the opportunity to write books. Like, you know, that's, that's, I understand that it's not a common uh, thing that a lot of people are able to do. But for me, I just really took to it. And the process of sitting down and trying to take your thoughts and get them into a form that someone who may never speak to you can understand them. I like the challenge of that because it's not easy. But when you can succeed at doing it, it really feels like it kind of just for me personally, it just takes me to another level as a communicator. Uh, so that, that's how I just would have good co-authors that, you know, and I also I would devote the time. I know like, OK, I have a deadline in six months, so I need to devote these amount of weekends, these amount of evenings to be able to work on the book. And thankfully, it all just kind of worked together. So what's more anxiety ridden, a movie premiere or a book premiere? Book, oh, a book really. premiere. A book. Oh, my goodness. Because the, the, a movie, by the time you get to the movie premiere, you're, you're like celebrating, you're excited. But when you get to a book, like you don't know how that book's going to sell. So, mm. you, you, so selling a book, you do all these months of, you know, just pre-sales and setting up the audience and marketing to your audience. And then when the book's on sale, it may sell or not. I mean, I've been in situations as an author where the book sold, you know, when it came out and then it didn't. So whenever a book gets gets ready to release, I'm a lot more nervous because I'm like, man, I don't know how this is going to play out. Like, hopefully <laughs> this works. Hopefully it does. Hopefully it doesn't. We'll see. I mean, hopefully it works and that it doesn't not work. But uh, when I get to a movie premiere, that's more about celebrating. And also, you're still promoting the movie, right? You're doing press. You're still so there's still a sense of excitement and relief that we finally got here. Whereas upon releasing a book, it's nothing but anxiety because <laughs> it's so hard to do. Uh. A quick question, I guess, when we're talking about atheists and faith in this. And wouldn't, if there is a plan for everything and a plan for everyone and a plan, an ultimate plan, wouldn't atheists be in that plan? Of course. Like, maybe that's their distinction and that's what they're supposed to do. But if that's what they're supposed to do, then when they get up there and guys like, hey, man, you did what you're supposed to do. You was an atheist. Then that can't, like... And that doesn't really work with like you ha you got to find Jesus before you get in type of thing. You know, again, like we're all God's children. So the nuances of everyone's relationship with God and the permutations of those nuances will never be able to, you know, equate for uh, or account for. So I trust that God is operating in the life of, of an atheist uh, in the same way he's operating in my life. And maybe there's a point of, of belief that we never know about. Mm. Maybe there is a point of, of understanding and acceptance that we're never privy to. So at the end of the day, I have to trust his plan and this experience and experiment called humanity is something we all need it. And we all play a part. And what those parts are, I'm not going to begin to tell you I fully understand because I don't. Right? Mm. And that's the beauty of for me. Yeah. I'm like, there's a lot I don't know. And that's okay. I'm, I'm okay to sit here and say, yeah, there's things I know and there's a lot I don't. And when it comes to God, every day is, is a mystery and every day I'm learning more. And I believe that's an eternal process because God is far bigger than anything we can comprehend. And how it all works is far beyond our capacity as well to fully comprehend. Do you believe in heaven and hell? I do believe that there is a heaven. I do believe what the scripture, you know, talks about. I do believe that. You believe uh, there is a hell? I do believe the two go hand in hand. I mean, you know, wow. when you look at the scripture, scripture is pretty clear about both. So, yeah, I do believe in both. Mm. So, and it's for me, my last question. What was your welcome to the league moment in Hollywood? Like, you know, that type of phrasing? Yeah. Um, probably that moment would have been. Back when I was interning for uh, Benny Medina and uh, part of my internship was I would function at when I was in the office, I would kind of be like his third assistant and I would drive him around to whatever appointments he would have. And I loved it because I was able to hear his phone conversations. I was able to be out in the field and meet people. And so it was great. Like, I really loved it. I'm like, man, I could drive you. It was, this is before Ubers mm -hmm. and Lyft. So I was the original, you know, Uber, you know what I mean, for Benny. And so there was one time uh, one of his artists was having a, doing a rehearsal for an award show. 
And so I drove him to the rehearsal. And then the plan was he wanted to go from the rehearsal back to his house to change and then come back to the venue. I said, cool. So the rehearsal was over and he was like, hey, man, go get the car. I'm ready. I go to the car and I can't find the key. And I was like, oh, no, I looked in my pockets. The car happened to be open. I opened the car. I looked through the car. There was no key. So he's looking at me on the other side of the parking lot, like with a confused look. And, I, and, and you know, Benny is is Benny is is a tough dude. You know what I mean? I don't know how he is now, but back in the day, you know, you know, he was very tough. So I go over to him and he says, what's the problem? I said, I can't find the key. And he just looks me dead in my eyes and says, find it. No sympathy, no empathy, nothing. Just find it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I go through. I'm looking through the parking lot of the venue. I'm going inside. Can't find the key. Finally, I call the office. One of the assistants brings a spare key. But by the time the spare key arrives, there's no time for him to go home and change. So he stays at the, at the show in what he's wearing. He wasn't very happy about it. Show is over. He's so I get his car after the show to drive to drive his car back home because that's where my car was. And he's in this limo with the talent. So this is the true story. I'm driving his car about to leave. And the next thing you know, the limo pulls up. I don't know who it is. Rolls down the window. Benny's in the limo. And he's like, where are you going? I said, oh, man, I'm just going into to your house to return your car. And then <laughs> the window goes up in the limo. He doesn't say a word. So I'm like, all right. This might, it's, this is it. It's over. My job's over. Internship's over. So I drive his car home. I drop it off. I get in my car. I go home. And I just know that I'm getting a call the next day. Don't come in the office. So I never, I didn't get the call. A few days later, I go into the office when I was supposed to be there. And I just work. And one of the assistants says, Devon, I got something funny to tell you. I said, what was it? They were like, um, you know how you had the whole thing, losing his key? They said, yeah. So the other day, Benny was in the office. And your name came up. And he said, didn't I fire him? And, mm. uh, and one of the assistants said, no, nah, you wouldn't fire Devon. You like him. And they were like, yeah, you're right. And that was it. That was it. <sighs> so that was my welcome to Hollywood. Like, yo, like when, here's the thing. My insurance with Benny was good. Because I had served him. I had been of service to him. He knew that I was excellent. I was on time. So when I needed a little bit of insurance, I had it. And that was my welcome, like, oh, okay, God, you're not going to do this whole thing perfectly. But I think a lot of times in this generation, people are looking to make withdrawals from accounts they put nothing in. That's true. <laughs> you know, this generation wants it, but they haven't worked for it, right? So with Benny, it wasn't like I just got there the first day and made a mistake. This was, you know, a year into the process where it's like, okay, no, this, I'm not, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't let him go. So that was, that let me know, like, okay, don't go out there just making mistakes for no reason, but also know that you're going to do your best and some days you're going to fall short. And at the end of the day, if you have served and you've been of service on some level, that's going to be enough to provide some insurance for you. That's dope. And what was thank, the key? No idea. <laughs> key still lost. God. <laughs> For whatever happened in that limo for him to forget to fire you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that, man. I'm not touching that. <laughs> he woke up the next day and forgot to fire you. Until that dude asked. <laughs> Devon, my last question of the day. I was just be curious. Do you have a great Will Smith story? Because we hear so many wonderful things about him. Oh, man. I, I mean, that's a whole other podcast, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, Will has been, uh, you know... A brother, a friend, a mentor, an inspiration for almost 30 years now. I mean, mm. We met when I was 18 years old. And to this day, to this day, like, you know, Bad Boys just came out. Right. And he, you know, was out there promoting the movie. And there was something I needed, you know, just his guidance on. So I sent him a voice note like, hey, man, here's what I'm dealing with. I'm, I'm curious. What would you think? He picks up the phone and calls. Mm. We're on the phone for an hour. And he's in the midst of the press tour. Doesn't matter. Here's, what, here's how I would look at this. And he's just giving me, dropping knowledge and science. And, and Will is one of the most spiritual people I've ever met in my life. Wow. Most people don't know. Like, he has tapped into God in a way that is just uh, incredible. And so, you know, my stories about him are, are just that any time I have ever put up the bat signal, he's always showed up. And that's the kind of guy that he is. He just is, it's not just about what goes on the screen. It's about who he is off camera and i can tell you as somebody has known him for well over half my life 
that he is one of the most genuine, authentic, amazing people I've ever met. And I'm grateful that in what God wanted to do in his life and my life, as it relates to life in this career, that that partnership and that guidance was needed, right? Like I didn't pursue a relationship with Will. It just so happened that he was uh, managed at the same company uh, that I first interned at. Right. And so to pursue an internship and to pursue this business and will be part of my story, I say, wow, God, thank you. And for me to, you know, impact him in the ways that I've impacted his life and his story. So, you know, again, specific stories would take a whole nother podcast, right. but just generally know that, uh, you know, like I said, anytime I put up the bat signal, he shows up. Dope. Now, uh, what do you guess currently working on? What do you got in the mix? I saw a couple things that I said you were working on. I thought I saw a superhero movie or something. Oh, there. well, uh, I'm a producer on uh, the Masters of the Universe, uh, you know, franchise, which is cool. Uh, is that He-Man? He-Man, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a producer on that. Uh, but the movie that I'm getting ready to produce is the first film that Tyler Perry and I are producing for our Netflix deal. Uh, it's called R&B. You know, I mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Uh, it's a modern-day retelling of the biblical love story of Ruth and Boaz. Uh, we start production in October, and that'll be on Netflix uh, second quarter of next year. And then I'll go right into that, uh, producing a film for Amazon called Relationship Goals, which is uh, kind of like a faith-based romantic comedy based upon a New York, best, uh, New York Times best-selling book. I'm glad you're bringing romantic comedies back. Yeah, you they know. They need a we, comeback. We got we to bring love back, yeah. you know what I mean? It's important. <laughs> My next two movies are love stories. So, yeah, yeah. Hancock great. was great. Hancock, yeah, Hancock was, was great. great. Hancock was, uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun to make that, too. Yeah, how was how'd that go? It was great, man. I mean, working with Will, working with Charlize, you know, and that story was, yeah. we were always trying to figure out the mythology and, you know, how it was going to work and the tone of, and I working with Pete Berg. I mean, I that, too. that took a lot, a lot of work, but it came out great. Yeah, like, so there's a lot of great moments in that movie and yeah, just man. a drunk superhero that has to make a comeback is crazy. You know what I mean? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. just a crazy concept. So, yeah, man. Well, thanks for stopping in. Um, good luck yeah. in all your future adventures. <laughs> Thank you. You know what I mean? Thanks for blessing us with your presence Thank on you. this wild-ass podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. Thanks for stopping in. That's you another episode. Yep. In Woo. the books. <laughs>